So we started looking at example 3.2 or 7.3, excuse me. I don't know where I got that from. And I think this is worth going through in, in detail. And I know we started it, but we didn't get very far. So I want to go through this to try to help, you know, with the, with the details and stuff. So here we go. We have a 1500 kilogram car. It's approaching a hill at 10 meters per second when it suddenly runs out of gas. Can the car make it to the top of the hill by coasting? Then if your answer in part A is yes, what is this car's speed after coasting down the other side? So the first question we have to ask is, can one use conservation of mechanical energy? And the answer always is that it it depends on how you choose your system. So let's look at that. So if I, so there's two processes. So the first one that you can do, let's say that you pick system one here, your system is only the car. So if that's the case, we know that we're going to be going up a hill. So you could imagine that if I have this process and I have a car on a hill, then what we know here that as it's going up the hill, it's going to experience two forces. So here is the car. And so when I'm looking at this thing, I'm seeing that the two forces are, is that there's a normal force and there is the force of gravity. Now, what you're seeing here is that both of these forces are external to the system. And so when I look at this, I could then say that the network has to be accounted for by these two. But I know that the displacement is going in this direction. Now note that the displacement there, it has an X and a Y component. So when I look at this, I'm always going to find that for the normal force, that it's always going to be perpendicular to the um, to the displacement. And we know that perpendicular forces never do any work. On the other hand, in this situation, D has a Y component. So when I look at this, I then see that I have the force of gravity going this way. Oops. And I'm going to have a down, as I go up, I'm going to have negative work. Or if I go down, I'm going to do positive work. And you could see from this picture here, as, as it goes up, gravity is going to be doing negative work. And then it's going to be positive work as it goes down the hill. So what you're seeing here is that the only non-zero work here is gravity. 
So that implies that energy is not conserved. In other words, when I look at the work energy theorem, it says that K1 plus the work of gravity equals K2. where A1 is not the same as K2. So in this situation, one must use the work energy theory. Now, let's look at system two. If I look at system two, here we're going to choose the system in such a way so that the system is both the car and earth. So if I take this thing, and let's say that I just recopy it down here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify this slightly. So if I look at this thing, I now have the Earth here. So the system now essentially includes the Earth. Very subtle, right? It includes the Earth, whereas up here, it did not. It was external to the system. So now if I have this situation and I played the same game, then I could say here that the network, again, there is the normal work, but we already agree that that's zero. But now this work of gravity can be redefined as a potential energy. In other words, I can rewrite the work of gravity as a potential function, which then tells me that this is zero minus the work of the, the work stored as potential energy and the kinetic energy. And because of this, this tells me here is that I can rewrite this as K1 plus UG1 equals K2 plus UG2. And this guy is a constant. This is mechanical energy. So in this situation, we say that energy is conserved. So one should use conservation of energy, of mechanical energy, I should say. And why choose mechanical energy? Because it's easier, that's why. That's the, the thing here, it's easier. So now we have, let's look at the question here. So if I look at the question, it says, can the car make it to the top of the hill? So what I need to do is I need to draw this situation. So the first part of the question is, can the car make it up the hill? So now we know that we are going to use conservation of mechanical energy. So what is my picture here? So what I imagine is that I'm going to have something like this here. I'm going to have my car. Let's say it's coasting. So it's right here. And so when I look at it, It's going to be moving and it's going to have some initial speed. 
which is V1 equal to 10 meters per second. Now that speed does, will not change unless it's converting kinetic energy into potential energy. So then it goes up the hill. And then what we're looking at is we're looking at the situation. What is the requirement to get up to the top of the hill? Well, the requirement is, is that when I'm looking at this, I'm going to imagine that since this is the only picture we care about right now, I'm going to set, I'm going to call this energy state one. So I'm going to say that at energy state one, okay, let's imagine that we have this that we're looking at. So at energy state one, what we're looking at here is that I need to compare the energy to this energy at two. Now, there is this angle of 30 degrees, but that is a decoy. And it's really only there to confuse you. All we know is that to get up to the top of the hill, it has to climb five meters. And the question, can it climb five meters? So what we want to do here is that we want to look at the minimum condition here. So I'm going to use a bar diagram. And this is why I always say start with a bar diagram. Because they're conceptually extremely powerful in visualizing what's going on. So I'm going to use a bar diagram to showcase the situation. Now, what we see here is that for the car to make it all the way up to the top, it has to have this amount of potential energy. And you can see here that I need this minimum amount of energy. That's the minimum. So when I look at the kinetic energy, if the kinetic energy is here, if it's at least this much at K1, then it's going to get up to the top of the hill. So the two situations that I could see here is that the kinetic energy is equal or smaller, excuse me, equal or larger than this situation right here. So in this case, let's call this, I don't know, case number one. So in case number one, if the kinetic energy is greater than this, then I can have a tiny bit of kinetic energy at the top. And if I have a tiny bit of kinetic energy at the top, what's going to happen? If I get up to the top and now I have zero speed, then I will never get down here. So in order for me to get all the way down to the hill, I have to have some tiny amount of speed at the top. And that's what this is showing me right here. So if the kinetic energy is zero at the top, it will never get down. That's case one. On the other hand, I need to compare this to a second case. So now if I compare this to this other case, again, this is the minimum energy right here. This is the minimum that I must have. So if I have this minimum, and my kinetic energy is smaller than that potential energy, then what we're going to find out in this situation, when I compare them in case two, then we could say here is that in 
case two since UG2 is greater than K1, the car does not make it to the top. Okay. That's what we mean by case two. On the other hand, in this situation, we then say that if K1 is greater than UG2, then the car makes it to the top and goes down the other side. So I need, so what this is telling me here is that there's a condition, okay? So our condition is K1 must be greater than UG2. That has to be the case. This is our condition right here. We need that. So we have to calculate those two terms here. So let's calculate this. So now let's compute these two energies. to determine um, which case is true. So we calculate K1. K1 says that it has to be 1 half mv1 squared. So if we scroll up to the numbers, we see that our, we have two numbers. We know that the mass of the car is 1500 kilograms. V1 is 10 meters per second. So if I substitute that into our e equation, we see that this will be 1500 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared. And that gives me 7.5 times 10 to the four joules or we can more easily write this as 75 kilojoules, and that's the kinetic energy at one. Now, if I now calculate the potential energy at two, that's gonna be mg times the height change. So when I look at this height change, what we're seeing here is that this is really mg y2 minus y1. And we know that y1 we've already set to zero because that's how we defined it right here. This was our reference height. So now if I put in my numbers, this is going to then be I know that y2 is 5 meters, so plugging in my numbers, I'm going to get 1,500 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times 5 meters, and that gives me 7.4 times 10 to the 4 joules, or easier writing is kilojoules, which will then give me UG2. So when we compare this, these two here, so comparing them, we see here is that K1, which is 75 kilojoules, is greater 
than, than UG2, which is 74 kilojoules. That implies that we are, that we have the situation for case number one. In other words, the car um, initially has enough energy to make it up to the top and go down the other side. And that's really the question that we're looking at. So if I look at this as a bar diagram, here's what we see. We see that we have this amount of kinetic energy initially, And what we know about this kinetic energy is that this kinetic energy is 75 kilojoules. I can't have more energy than this. So what happens here is that you can see is that part of the gravitational potential here, that is 74 kilojoules which then means that there's a tiny bit of kinetic energy left, K2, and you could see that the difference between these two, right? So if that's 75 and this is 74, this has to be one kilojoule of kinetic energy. So just from the picture, we can calculate the speed at the top. Since K2, which is one half mv2 squared, is one kilojoule. We won't because we don't need to, but that's what that is right there. So now what we wanna do is that we wanna to go to the last part here. And this is the last part of the question. Now that we know that the car can go over the hill, we wanna go and we wanna look at that. So I'm gonna take this with me. I'm gonna copy it. And so now to answer what happens on the other side, we need the full picture of the situation. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to paste this guy in. And what I'm seeing here is that I want to be careful because now what we're, we're seeing here is that there's a downhill. So let's say that this is going like this, and then this is a downhill. And when I look at how we have been defining heights here, one of the things that we notice here is that we have been calling y1 equal to zero. And, but if we look at the overall picture, you could see that this is not the bottom anymore. So we have to make a choice. We can choose where the car is at to be y1 equal to zero, or we can redefine what, what zero is. So the question that we're asking, um, we can redefine 
are zero reference point. And there's multiple ways of doing this problem. So here's what we know. We know that the car has some speed V2 that should be smaller than 10 meters per second. So what we expect here is that if I redefine my zero, which I'm going to do just so you could see a different picture, you see this zero? I'm not going to choose that as zero anymore. What I'm going to choose is that I'm going to pick my car. Let me grab this car. And I'm going to put the car down here at the bottom. And we expect that this car should be going faster than the car at point one. So now, what I'm seeing here is that now this is my new reference right here. I'm going to choose at this energy state three, I'm going to choose y3 equal to zero. So then there's a picture here. So the picture here is that now this is a five meter height, which means that now I'm going to pick Y1 and I'm going to call it prime to separate this guy. And I'm going to say that that is five meters from the ground here. So that Y2 has to change. So if I now go back and change this, look what I'm going to do now. I'm going to erase this and erase this here. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to say this right here is also five meters. So what this tells me then is that I can redefine a new term. And I'm gonna define this term as Y2 prime, and you could see that that is 10 meters. So that's the height of the car at 10 meters. So the question is, what do we want to do here? We should look at conservation of mechanical energy again. So we know that the gravitational potential tau is a height parameter. So then let's go draw it. So if I look at the height of one, we clearly see that we have a different potential energy from problem from the first part, and I'm going to call this YG1 prime because that's associated with five meters. And then when I go look at car two, you could see here is that this should be double the height. And this will be Y, oops. UG2 prime, and that's associated with the 10 meters. And this is because we're all referencing everything relative to Y3. So when I come to Y to UG3, that is clearly zero now. So now, conservation of mechanical energy must hold. So when I look at the top, we agreed here that this had to have a tiny bit of kinetic energy at two. So we know that's the case. So now I know that this is my total energy, that because mechanical energy is conserved, so this has to be my constant. So now I could just fill it in. So if I fill this in, I'm gonna go all the way up to the top. And that has to be my kinetic energy at one. And then if I look all the way down here, I have to fill all of this up because that's my kinetic energy three. 
So conservation of energy immediately tells you physically what is going on by looking at these bar diagrams. And so just to summarize what we just did, I want to say here that we changed our reference ground. In other words, we chose Y1, 0 initially and redefined it to Y3 prime equals to 0. So now, from the bar diagram, We write out our energy equation. So here we go. I know that the energy of one is equal to the energy of two, which is equal to the energy of three. We know everything about state one. And so this guy now becomes our known energy. Why is it known? Because we know V1 is 10 meters per second. We know that our height, Y1 prime, is 5 meters. And then here at energy 3 is our unknown energy. And so when I look at that, we don't know what the speed is at three, but we do know what the height is. So I'm only going to focus on one and three here. I don't need to look at, at uh, two. So then I'm going to focus on those guys. So then I say that I have kinetic energy one plus UG one prime is then going to equal K3 plus UG3 prime, but we can see already that the potential is zero from the bar diagram. I didn't even have to write it. So now I'm going to write each of these individual terms. So note that by drawing the bar diagram as well, you're identifying what are the energies there. So then it's going to be one half mv1 squared plus mg, the height change, and that has to equal one-half mv3 squared. So immediately, because the only force is gravity in the system, the masses all cancel out. So then, this gives the condition to solve for V3. And the beauty of this thing, I don't have to worry about what's external. All I have to worry about, did I include Earth? Did I include the spring? If I do, I can define a potential function. And if I didn't, then I have to look at the works and, and the direction of the displacement. Here, we don't care. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to isolate V3. So if I isolate V3, I'm going to bring this and I'm going to say that V3, I'm going to multiply everything by 2. So then that gives me V1 squared. And then I'm going to get 2G delta Y. So what's the height change? So we know the speed 1. They told us that the speed 1 
is 10 meters per second. So what's this height change? Well, the height change is going to be, when you look at it, the height change starts off at, um, we could see that the height change, it's going down. So it's really y1 minus 0, and there is no sign here. So because it's going to go from, from here, you can see here is that the height change is really 5 meters. So if I plug everything in here, I'm then going to get 10 meters per second squared plus 2 times 9.8 meters per second squared times 5 meters. I'm going to take the square root. And then this will then give me 14 meters per second. And that is V3. And that's the speed of the car. Now, does this make sense? Does this value make sense? And the answer is yes. Why? Because we expected a faster car at the bottom of the hill. In other words, V3, which is 14 meters per second, is greater than V1, which started out at 10 meters per second. It's exactly what we expected.